Good morning, everybody. This is Genevieve Johnson. I am the coordinator for the Desert LCC. Um, we are starting this morning with a webinar in our Landscape Conservation Design webinar series um, from Rob Tamboloni of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Just so everybody knows, um, we are recording this presentation. We will make the recording available on our YouTube channel in just a few days um, after the end of this presentation today. If you have any questions during the presentation, please put them into the chat box if you're able. Um, I will read those questions off and, and we'll ask our presenter to answer them as we go along. Um, and then if you are having any trouble at all with the if you're having any trouble at all um, with the chat box, um, you can also send me a quick email. It's gjohnson at usbr.gov, and um, we'll try to get people unmuted to ask questions if that's possible. So we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. Um, again, welcome. Um, today our webinar is Nine Tips for How to Make a Truly Terrible Landscape Conservation Design. Our presenter is Rob Campoloni from the Landscape Conservation Design Policy um, he's a policy advisor for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service National Wildlife Refuge System. He has two degrees from the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry. He has a degree in environmental studies and in natural resource management, both of those um, looking at um, concentrations of human population dynamics and sustainability and planning. Rob also has 20 years of experience in natural resource planning and working for a diversity of organizations and agencies besides the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, including Venezuela's Ministry of the Environment, the Nature Conservancy, the U.S. Forest Service, and the National Park Service. Um, on a personal note, uh, Rob has been instrumental in helping the landscape conservation cooperatives um, look at how to include landscape conservation design into our processes, um, especially looking at large issues across these landscapes, large threats and stressors, and how we can collaboratively come together to look at solving them. Um, with that, Rob, I will turn it over to you, and we'll go ahead and get started on the presentation. Excellent. Thanks, Jen. I appreciate that warm welcome. And uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar. Uh, I would also like to thank Jen, the members of the Desert LCC Steering Committee, uh, the National Wildlife Refuge System leadership for giving me an opportunity to uh, take part in this webinar today. Um, I hope uh, and I trust it will ultimately be a, uh, ultimately become a very thoughtful discussion about landscape conservation design or LCD for short. Uh, this is actually the second time that I've presented to the Desert LCC Steering Committee. The first time was in Flagstaff um, last July, which I thought was a, a great meeting, uh, by the way. We spent a lot of time talking about landscape conservation design, and I feel like you guys are already on the right track and forging ahead and making great progress, so congratulations there. But I'm also really excited that you know we're continuing this discussion here today, and uh, through means of technology, uh, we're bringing in some additional folks into the conversation uh, via webinar. Uh, so that's great. For those of you who don't know me or my background, I, I've actually had some history working with the LCCs. I, I did a one-year detail in the National Coordination Office under Doug Austin's leadership back in 2013. You know, at that time, uh, there was just a few LCC opinion leaders like Jen and Ken McDermott and Andrew Milliken, uh, Rua Mordecai and others uh, scattered around the country that were promoting this idea of landscape conservation design as a standard operating procedure for the LCC network. And when I think back on where we were with LCD back in 2013, you know, just, just starting to explore a vision for it and compare that to where we're at today with projects underway in most, if not all, of the LCC partnership geographies, well, it, you know, it really blows my mind to think about how far we've come in such a short period of time. 
And for that, I applaud all of you for your hard work and dedication and trying to make LCD a truly terrific and successful venture. Right. So my intention today is just to initiate a conversation, you know, that we, the larger community of, of practitioners and stakeholders, really need to have, and that is, you know, how do we do landscape conservation design? And, and to that end, I'd like to share with you the results of some recent research that a cross-jurisdictional body of authors and I undertook. Uh, well, we started in 2015 and it went through 2016. Uh, but with any luck, uh, we hope to have that uh, paper published here in, in landscape and urban planning shortly. But I'll, I'll summarize the paper here today, which will include a short discussion about why we need to undertake a landscape conservation design approach to the work that we do. I'll also provide a definition for landscape conservation design, at least the definition that I'm working within. Um, and I'll introduce you to the ICAST platform that we um, roll out in this paper. And the, but the majority of my presentation will really be framed around ICAS's nine principles and uh, the associated pitfalls to avoid when undertaking landscape conservation design. So I, I think it's important for us to try to start today's conversation from a common place of agreement as to why it's even important for us to be thinking about a landscape conservation design approach to the work we do. You know, recognizing that there's a a wide variety and diversity of agencies and organizations represented uh, not only in the landscapes that we work in, but on this phone call today. Uh, and we all have different missions, goals, and objectives. So um, here's four quick high-level reasons that I've come up with, and, and they're surely not the end-all, be-all by any means. But um, you know, we could easily spend the next hour or so talking about just the social, economic, and environmental change and uncertainty that we're facing, not only in this country, but around the world. Uh, but then we'd miss this opportunity to uh, discuss the equally important question of how to design for sustainability. Oh, as a side note, I will say that I'm using Wu's definition of sustainability, which is an overall condition of low vulnerability and high resilience. And that was published in his 2013 paper entitled Landscape Sustainability Science, Ecosystem Services, and Human Well-Being in Changing Landscapes. Anyway, I think it's it suffice to say for our conversation here today that the Anthropocene is a super wicked problem, and that's a technical term, uh, that can't be adequately addressed or managed using siloed decision-making approaches, that we need a new business model. That said, I, I think it's important to note for, uh, that there are a few less common reasons for why we uh, should undertake LCD. For instance, for instance, you know, organizationally, uh, federal, state, and local governments and non-governmental organizations are and have been and will continue to be asked to do more with less in terms of financial and human resources. So instituting a new approach in a time of declining budgets and human resources makes a whole hell of a lot of sense. Operationally, you know, many on-the-ground decision makers and natural resource managers have argued for a more flexible planning, i.e. decision-making approach, one that empowers them, you know, the people who are closest to the resources on the ground, to actually be a part of that process. And philosophically, one could argue that just as Earth's ecological conditions and human civilizations have evolved over the course of the Holocene and will continue to do so into the Anthropocene, so too must the intentions, the governance structures, and processes that we use to guide decision making. That's to say that LCD is just a natural evolutionary step change to how we plan. 
Okay, so before we get into the nine principles and pitfalls, I'd like to try to make sure we're all starting from a common place in terms of what LCD is, because I know there's a number of different schools of thought out there, and that's okay, but we need a common starting place uh, for this presentation. I'll introduce you to the ICAS platform and take a look at the attributes and principles for developing a truly terrific LCD. But before I do that, let me share with you the definition that I'll be using today. You'll see here uh, in just a few seconds that it's framed around what we call four cornerstones of innovation. People, purpose, process, and product. And the ICAST platform's attributes and principles are organized around those cornerstones as well. Okay, so LCD, uh, is a, a stakeholder-driven, participatory process that integrates societal values and cross-jurisdictional, multi-sector interest, that's the people part, with best available interdisciplinary science and traditional knowledge to assess the spatial and temporal patterns, vulnerabilities, risks, and opportunities that's some of the process that we go through, to develop a set of spatially explicit products and, in my mind, more importantly, multi-objective adaptation strategies. They're, they're the products that promote resilience and sustainability of social ecological systems for current and future generations. That's our, our foundational principle. That's our purpose for coming together as a, as a cross-jurisdictional, multi-sector body of stakeholders to do this thing we call design, to promote sustainability. So the, the governance and adaptation plan literature that we reviewed uh, in development of our paper is fairly consistent in the belief that innovative approaches are necessary if we have any hope of, for building sustainability into social ecological systems. The ICAST platform, which is a heuristic for LCD, is an innovation systems framework a holistic yet flexible approach to landscape conservation design that consists of five attributes and nine principles that facilitate social learning amongst diverse stakeholders and empowers them to use that knowledge to question existing norms and design concepts, services, products that promote landscape conservation. The ICAS acronym stands for, and you can follow me around the di diagram that's on the screen, starting in the center of the wheel, I equals innovation. C equals an inclusive um, process of convening stakeholders. A equals an interdisciplinary assessment of landscape conditions. The first S in ICAST stands for interactive spatial design. And the second one, stands for informative strategy design. The ICAS platform's contribution to landscape conservation rests in the, in the synthesis of complex adaptation planning concepts and methodologies presented as a set of attributes and principles that are organized around those four cornerstones of innovation I mentioned earlier, people, purpose, process, and product, similar to how we organized our definition of LCD. Now, we won't spend you know, any time looking in detail at the principles here, since we'll do that throughout the remainder of the presentation. But I will say that uh, ICAS emphasizes an innovative design process that is inclusive, interdisciplinary, interactive, and informative. And, it's, and the goal of it is to ensure diverse stakeholders are involved and interact and co-produce knowledge that informs the decisions that they make collectively in addressing the challenges that they face. 
in their landscapes. All right, so uh, let's take a, a look, a closer look at the ICAST platform and some of the pitfalls to avoid uh, in landscape conservation design. Landscape conservation, this idea of building a resilient and sustainable landscape, requires a design process that facilitates innovation, which I'm defining here as uh, the exploration, development, and application of ideas that address wicked problems and improve human well-being. And that comes from Tim Brown's uh, 2009 book uh, entitled Change by Design. Innovation in landscape conservation stems from and is, uh, is rooted in integrated governance. Uh, and uh, those of you in the LCCs know what integrated governance is. You guys are living it and breathing it. It's uh, stakeholder-driven, participatory, decision-making approaches that are grounded in social networks and social learning. Integrated governance that's inclusive, interdisciplinary, interactive, and informative fosters innovation so that the idea of integration is fundamental in landscape conservation and in landscape conservation design. So if an institution doesn't believe for any reason that you know, we're not faced with wicked problems today, like the Anthropocene and or sustainability, um, that can be addressed by innovation, then you know, we might expect them to, to probably take a more customary, um, uh, that's the way we've always done business type of a, an approach to planning. This first pitfall is probably the hardest to resist. We're all very com comfortable with our tried and true planning approaches. So the natural inclination is going to be to continue with the status quo, uh, even when we're trying to do landscape conservation design. But I think when we think of landscape conservation design, uh, we need to think of it in terms of innovation. Landscape conservation can only be achieved when diverse social networks consisting of cross-jurisdictional multi-sector stakeholders come together to identify a shared vision for the landscape that's responsive to you know, their choices, their needs, and their perceptions of risk. Having a shared vision for the landscape can be an effective way to start a, con a, a collaborative, cooperative design effort. And if they're lucky, if we're lucky, the process, that design process, this will ultimately end with a coordinated game plan for managing a multifunctional landscape. But for whatever reason, you know, an institution may find taking a stakeholder-driven participatory design approach to landscape conservation design to be cumbersome and as a result be tempted to take a, a go-it-alone approach. But a go-it-alone approach that neglects the interest of other stakeholders perpetuates the status quo uh, that we're currently in, the situation that we're currently in, and it facilitates incremental management, incremental decisions uh, and that, you know, nevertheless ultimately end up in conflict. So, you know, and, and maybe that's another line item that I need to add to my earlier slide about why we do LCD, and that is to to try and minimize and reduce conflict amongst landscape stakeholders. Building an effective uh, partnership, uh, you know, ones that are capable of enduring the challenges of extended collaboration efforts is, is quite difficult, as you guys know. And improved approaches to enhancing stakeholder engagement are really needed if we're going to transform uh, from uh, traditional planning approaches to landscape conservation design with the intent of getting to a sustainable future. Inclusive processes are grounded in three core principles of open governance, participation, transparency, and collaboration. 
and a real commitment to deliberation, you know, that purposeful process that empowers stakeholders by providing facilitated forums uh, to consider and compare and contrast views is really necessary when, when convening diverse stakeholders. Now, an institution may be tempted to take a more top-down vertical decision-making approach to landscape conservation design for a whole slew of different reasons. But when it comes to landscape conservation, an approach that neglects to include other stakeholders in the decision-making process, again, perpetuates the status quo, and that's exactly what we're trying to move away from. When we think of LCD, particularly when we're convening stakeholders, we need to think of it as an inclusive, stakeholder-driven process. Developing a design that promotes sustainability of a multifunctional landscape is a complex task that's suited to no single social, economic, or ecological discipline. Transdisciplinary cha challenges like the ones we face with landscape conservation can be addressed through the application of design methodologies that synthesize knowledge from many different disciplines and equally important from many different stakeholders. Bridging organizations like the LCCs play an important role in bringing people together including multidisciplinary research teams that include technical experts and non-technical stakeholders. An institution may find taking a multidisciplinary team approach to assessing uh, the things that they care about to be cumbersome. And it, it is cumbersome. We have to admit that. And, but as a result, uh, you know, taking that internal kind of subject matter expert driven approach, uh, which is quite different than what we're talking about here, you know, what, an approach that focuses on an institution's own individual interest in isolation of other things that are going on in the landscape is problematic. But such an approach wouldn't necessarily advance social learning from a broader stakeholder perspective nor result in a holistic understanding of the sociological system that we live in. And I think that's really what we're trying to do here, get a more holistic understanding of the landscape. Developing an interdisciplinary assessment that provides a holistic perspective of stakeholder interests requires stakeholders to be engaged in those processes. And we call those processes Participatory Interdisciplinary Assessment, or PIA. PIA takes a, an integrated approach that combines best available science and stakeholder knowledge to understand the risks, the vulnerabilities, and opportunities at various spatial and temporal scales under a range of plausible future scenarios. The use of participatory approaches in assessment development allows for different perspectives to be considered, which facilitates social learning, provides new insights for research, increases stakeholders' commitment to the science produced and used, and more importantly, informs the strategic decisions that result from the design process. An institution may be inclined to take a, a more quantitative modeling approach to understand their own individual interest and forego a qualitative normative modeling component. But again, such an approach wouldn't necessarily advance social learning nor provide that holistic perspective that we're looking for. When we think of landscape conservation design, particularly uh, when we're assessing current and plausible future conditions, we need to think of it in terms of being an exercise in interdisciplinary study. Landscapes provide multiple functions and numerous potential opportunities for both conservation and land use development. We know that. The role of spatial design is to identify the best places in our landscapes for both types of opportunities to occur. 
Designing a multifunctional landscape requires the engagement of stakeholders working directly with modelers to integrate their interest with scientific information and provides opportunity for social learning. Perhaps the most meaningful benefit of stakeholder engagement in spatial design is the trust that results from people interacting and engaging with those models. Now, an, an institution, uh, where am I? Yeah, an institution may find taking a participatory approach uh, to spatial design a challenge. And as a result, uh, be tempted to trend more towards a black box approach where contractors or special interest groups produce a map of priority areas for their own specific interest. But such an approach wouldn't necessarily build the trust in the methods that are used to identify those priority locations and or stakeholders' commitment in implementing that spatial design. In spatial design, stakeholders interact directly with technical experts and modelers via, via a series of design charrettes using decision support tools to identify landscape con configurations that promote adaptation, such as where conservation and development occurs across the landscape under different scenarios. Spatial design helps stakeholders organize and evaluate the cost and the benefits of various options that they select. It communicates the uncertainty associated with various trade-off decisions and ultimately identifies priorities. It results in a portfolio of maps of locations where specific land uses and or management actions can occur that promote resilience and sustainability. And it communicates those decisions visually. Now, if, if an institution doesn't believe there's a benefit to conducting spatial design in an open forum where landscape stakeholders are actively engaged in the decision-making process, we'd ex expect them to probably want to trend more towards a, a black box approach where priority locations are first ident identified internally uh, and then shared with sh stakeholders for review and comment. But that approach often raises a lot of questions about the processes that were used to identify those priorities and or uh, total disregard for the end product that, that results. When we think of LCD, particularly the spatial design portion of it, I think we need to think of it as an interactive process. Complementary to spatial design is strategy design, another key outcome of LCD. Strategy design addresses the knowledge action gap that occurs quite often in broad scale planning efforts. And it acknowledges the need for innovative approaches to governance that achieve collective impact. Strategy design attempts to put the landscape puzzle together through stakeholders' collective action. The goal of strategy design is to identify high-level strategies and stakeholders' roles in implementing those strategies that achieve the shared vision of the landscape that they identified all the way at the front end of the design process. Now, an institution may find it difficult to commit high-level decision makers to a, an LCD process for a whole slew of reasons. And as a result, the LCD then becomes nothing more than a collaboratively developed blueprint. But without, uh, without the strategies being identified for how stakeholders are um, going to implement uh, that vision that's expressed in the spatial design, I think we miss the mark. And, we end up just kind of producing a product that um, isn't going to meet uh, the sole purpose or intention of the design process. 
and ultimately lead us to a more resilient and sustainable landscape. Bridging organizations like the LCCs play an essential role in bringing stakeholders together around the scientific assessments and the spatial prioritizations that have been developed uh, throughout the design process. And stakeholders use that information in developing a strategic plan, a portfolio of strategies that articulate complementary opportunities uh, across the landscape. Fostering agreements among stakeholders requires facilitation skills, as you all know, or at least Jed does, and is aided by a diversity of tools like structured decision making, robust decision making, and trade-off analyses that help to ensure successful development of a strategic plan. Strategy design is a, a high-level articulation of where complementary organizational tools can be matched up to make stakeholders more effective and efficient at helping to build a resilient and sustainable landscape. An institution may be hesitant to, to include a strategic decision-making component in their design process, uh, and as a result, trend away from including the development of a strategic plan. But in doing so, I, I, again, I think it leaves stakeholders without any guidance on how to implement uh, the collaboratively developed spatial design. And so we, we kind of fail in our efforts, and that's nobody's intention. But when we think about landscape conservation design, I think we need to think of it as an informative, uh, strategic decision-making process. So I didn't want to take too much time um, with my presentation so that we could have more time in question and answer and in discussion. And um, so I'll kind of step off now and see if there is any questions or comments or feedback on my presentation would be greatly appreciated. Um, always looking to uh, improve uh, how I kind of communicate this to people. And uh, so, yeah, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, so folks, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to chat them in, or to put them in the chat box. Um, as we go forward. Um, we do have one question right now, Rob. Um, how is sustainability determined? Um, whose opinion is it and how is it done? Yeah, so, you know, I, I, the easy answer is, well, all that is delegated down to the, to the cross-jurisdictional multi-sector stakeholders that are engaging in the design process within, within those landscapes, wherever they may be. Um, and if you have if you have technical people, if you have non-technical people, um, if you have decision makers all a part of that process, then I think we're in good standing. I think there's um, if, if through facilitated discussion, those that diversity of participants uh, could not only go through the the science and prioritization and decision-making aspects of the design process, uh, but ultimately come out with some sort of collective agreement as to uh, how they're going to proceed, then I think they're standing on, on firm ground. Um, now, the problem uh, is when stakeholders, uh, with or without a lot of influence, um, uh, in that landscape are left out of the process. And uh, that's, that's problematic because as we all know, uh, eventually, you know, the word gets out to a broader suite of stakeholders that this uh, collaborative planning process was uh, undertaken or is underway and, and how come I wasn't invited to be a part of it. So uh, there's some real challenges with how you build that um, diverse stakeholder body, uh, but it can be done. Uh, there's you know, people much smarter than myself who have thought long and hard about how you uh, identify stakeholder groups and the connections across and among those uh, 
uh, those social networks uh, so that you have coverage uh, within the geography that you're designing for. Thank you, Rob. Um, we have another question um, from Deanne, um, who says, great presentation, by the way. And can you please talk a little bit about guidance for implementing the collaboratively developed design? Um, what are some examples? Um, does it go beyond just deciding where to do the work, but also how and with whom? Yeah, again, I mean, um, I, I think those decisions need to be delegated down to the people uh, involved in the design process. There's nobody better than those individuals who are on the ground, who are in that geography, who know it, love it, appreciate it, could articulate it, uh, uh, the values and the challenges that are faced within those geography than the people in those geographies. And so any sort of, uh, you know, Landscape conservation design, again, is a, a stakeholder-driven participatory process that really requires the stakeholders to engage in it. And that means, uh, you know, making a whole suite of decisions. Everything from um, what are the things that we're, we're interested in designing for, and that's typically on the front end of the design process, all the way down to, you know, okay, now that we've done all the great science and made a whole bunch of collaborative decisions along the way, here we are ready to identify strategies for how we could either conserve and or utilize uh, those resources in our ge geography. Uh, those stakeholders are the best ones to figure out those processes and the answers uh, that stem from them. I hope um, I answered yeah. that. Did I, did I answer that question, Jeff? Um, I think or maybe the, the person who asked the question, uh, if I didn't answer, please uh, chat in another one. Yes, thank you. Um, while we wait for that, there's another um, question or comment about um, how you weigh stakeholder opinion with those having economic interests. Yeah, so I mean, our, our landscapes are multifunctional, and they provide a whole suite of, of, of things for humans. Um, and humans interact uh, with those things differently. In some cases, uh, you know, there's conservation interest in our landscapes, and there's utilization interest in our landscapes. And, and the design process is meant to try and find a sustainable balance uh, for those things. Um, the way we used to do business, or, or, or quite frankly, the way we do do business now, is typically within our own silos and that just focus on our own individual interests. So the Fish and Wildlife Service has trust resources that we plan for. Um, and we do a good job planning for those things. Uh, sometimes uh, those decisions that stem from those planning processes sail through with no problem. And other times there's direct conflict with other interest in those landscapes. And so uh, we typically don't understand what those conflicts are uh, until towards the, towards the tail end of the planning process. Um, I think what we're trying to say with landscape conservation design is let's find out on the front end of the design process where those differences are and let's work together through this collaborative design process that uses science and, and collaborative decision making to try and come up with a, a balanced approach uh, for conservation and utilization. Great, thank you. We have another question um, and comment that says, great principles and pitfalls. So how does the landscape conservation design work when not all stakeholders see sustainability as a top priority? And then does sustainability become its own subject matter expert-driven approach within a larger society? 
You know, um, it may be true that there are some uh, stakeholders within a geography that um, haven't embraced the concept of resilience or, or sustainability. Uh, but one thing is for sure, those stakeholders have their own individual interest that they're willing to go to the mat for. That's a given. Every, every, uh, every individual, uh, every organization has their own um, vision, mission, goals, objectives, things that they care about, things that they want to um, ensure last uh, not only for current generations but out into future generations for their for maybe for their children or for their grandchildren and they want to make sure that 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 way of life or 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 that you know the missions uh, of their organizations um, are are able to endure these challenges and and these uncertainties that we face i think that's a given and so um you know, speaking about design to, to stakeholders really requires us to um, ensure that we're, we're speaking to the interest of those stakeholders. If, it, if it's a federal, state, local government agency, what are, you know, what are their mission goals, objectives, and, and let's speak, let the design process speak to those things. If it's a if it's a private landowner or just a, an individual who lives in a local community who is interested in what, what's going on, you know, well, what are your individual interests? And I think when we speak to people's interests and values, um, we're willing to bring them along uh, in the design process. Thanks, Fred. Um other, any other questions um, or comments? We have a few more that look like they're typing in. Um, while we wait for that, Rob, um, I have a question about the decision space um, and being able to make sure that decision makers feel comfortable in um, being able to implement some of the outcomes from the landscape conservation design process um, while also being true to you know whatever their uh, legal authority is. And I don't know if you have any experience in, in sort of that gray area well, in between. So is that specific to strategy design, Jeff? Yes. Yeah. So I, I think that um, you know we're talking. I, I think we're talking about some sort of plan, for lack of a better word, a strategic plan that kind of um, lays out a suite of, of approaches that we could take um, for addressing some of the threats. Uh, for ensuring continuation of our interest and our values and our landscapes. Uh, and that that information, that the, those uh, strategies uh, provide enough information for the collection of stakeholders to say, well, you know, my, my agency has this suite of tools in the toolbox and I could use some subset of my tools to implement a subset of the strategies that we identified in our strategy design, in our strategic plan. And I would like to kind of um, combine some of the tools that uh, I have in my agency with some of the tools that um, other stakeholders have in theirs. And so we have this, you know, this um, um, empowering we're, we're kind of there's a multiplying effect of you know different stakeholders coming together with uh, different tools to address a common goal or a need uh, and I think that's incredibly helpful uh, during this time of, of well, it's not just this time. This is nothing new. I mean, the, you know, we we as a community of 
practitioners and stakeholders have been struggling with um, re having enough resources, whether they be financial and or programmatic or human resources, to address the full suite of, of threats that uh, impact the things that we care about. And so being able to combine our, our resources um, to kind of uh, attack an issue, a uh, like-minded issue, I think is uh, very strategic, uh, particularly now. Great, thank you. Um, we have an another comment. Um, I assume the PowerPoint will be made available. Um, it is will be available through our YouTube channel um, and actually watching the entire um, presentation. Um, I don't know, Rob, how you feel about making the PowerPoint itself in a PDF format available. Um, no, if you're you okay. yep, you If bet. you're interested in getting the PDF format, um, please uh, email me, and I'll work with Rob to get that to you. I'll put my email address in the chat box right now. Um, but also the question is, is there um, a monograph or a publication of this model? And I know you mentioned that at the beginning, but if you could talk a little bit more about the publication. Yeah. So, I mean, we, uh, we were working on, on publishing a paper uh, that kind of rolls out the ICAST platform um, this, um, that speaks to the five attributes and the nine principles uh, for landscape conservation design. Um, I wonder if the questioner is asking more about are there real life examples um, out there uh, that people could turn to? Uh, or is the question specific to the, to the journal article? Um, well, this one just mentioned publication, but um, yeah, so, I mean, if you have another question, you can file, you can follow up. But um, I think also we did, um, back to Deanna's question earlier, there are some questions about real life examples too. Yep, real life examples are definitely good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, there are some, there's numerous real life examples uh, that pertain to each aspect or each attribute of ICAST, clearly. I mean, there's a whole bunch of really great work uh, that has been done uh, and, and that is being done in terms of being innovative and convening stakeholders and assessing, uh, you know, doing uh, landscape assessments and prioritization through interactive processes and, and developing strategic plans. I mean, there's a whole, you know, there's a whole body of information out there. What we're having a hard time with is finding an example uh, here in the United States uh, of a project um, that hits on all those things. Um, you know, the LCCs uh, have been um, working on landscape conservation design just for a few years now, and so many of their design products are, are, are um, specific to maybe one, two, or maybe even three of the three out of five of the of the attributes identified in ICAST. But they haven't gone through. They haven't completed the entire uh, adaptive loop uh, and, and completed a full suite of products. Um, so we're looking to other countries, and I, I know that design processes are underway in other. Uh, parts of the world, and so we, we're doing some investigative work to try and locate whether any of those products or processes hit on all five of the ICAS platform. Uh, you know, we're trying to, uh, the, the body of literature in integrated governance um, and adaptation planning is quite rich, and I think uh, you know, academics have been talking about this stuff, uh, and planners have been talking about this stuff uh, for 40 years. Uh, but now we're actually trying to do it on the ground, and and that's huge. And we're not, I don't think our, it, we're going to be great at it uh, initially. I hope we're good at it initially, 
but I'll, I'll take fair initially, you know. Uh, but I think through iteration and, and, you know, humans get better at the things that we do the more we try it. And I think uh, that holds true for landscape conservation design too. We will get better at this. And this is something that we've been talking about for 40 or 50 years now. And, and now that we're trying to do it, um, I'm confident that we'll only get better at it as we go. We have to, in fact. There's really no alternative uh, if you believe in, in, in the Anthropocene and, and the need for sustainability. Um, we have another question, um, which I'm not sure if it's directed specifically to you, Rob, but um, I think in general there's interest in knowing about um, you know, real life examples of these processes, but how we could make them more easily accessible to other members, um, anybody who's really interested in landscape conservation design. Um, and I wonder if maybe you wanted to mention the class a little bit, how we're trying to pull some of those things together, but also um, the LCC network itself is trying to pull together some examples, um, some practices um, that we've used or that folks around the country are using, um, and we are working on that document currently, um, and hopefully we'll be able to pull some of that information together in a way that makes um, it a little bit more accessible to partners. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense uh, for the LCC network to kind of um, pull that body of knowledge together and make that available to this, you know, the, what is it, five, six hundred stakeholders that the LCC network has um, and that is working with and, and make that information readily available to them. Um, another resource, as Jen mentioned, uh, you know, we're, we're developing a, a class at the National Conservation Training Center um, or for the National Conservation Training Center in landscape conservation design. Um, we anticipate that class being uh, more of a road show uh, than uh, and making it and coming and, and bringing that class to stakeholder groups uh, that are interested in engaging in a collaborative design process, um, as opposed to asking you know, the diversity of landscape stakeholders to all fly to West Virginia and to you know, pay for you know, NCTC um, facilities. It, it just makes more sense for us to kind of bring that to stakeholder groups that are interested in it. And so we're, uh, we're just early on in that course's development. Uh, we anticipate a 2018 rollout. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see. I don't want to, I don't want to guarantee that. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of examples that um, might be good examples for folks to look into as well. Um, Pima County's Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan um, being one of them and their collaborative stakeholder process and then also um, urban design for a barrio in San Diego, California. Um, Tim, if you wouldn't mind actually emailing me that example, that would be really helpful. Um, we also have a note that um, we can probably find some examples of where this doesn't work or hadn't worked um, well, and maybe learn from the pitfalls of, of that process. Um, and then one question um, for you, Rob, do you have advice for how to maintain partnerships to allow for the long-term implementation of the LCDs? Yeah, you know, I think um, an important part of all this is uh, having early success, early and often success. Um, that I, I think that it would be hard for stakeholders to stay engaged in a multi-year design process and not see anything out of it until the end. Um, I think that that would be asking a lot. So somehow, we, uh, the coordinators of, of design processes, um, need to be able to develop products uh, throughout the design process uh, that that the stakeholders need, uh, and, and products that answer some of the questions or help them in some way 
uh, do the work that they do and or um, conserve or utilize the resources that they um, are interested in. So early and often success stories would be my recommendation for maintaining uh, a strong partnership. Along those lines, Rob, I wonder if you could maybe um, discuss a little bit about um, who some of those key players, not in terms of decision makers and stakeholders, but that core staff that you feel is important to be part of a team to make sure that we are able to communicate, um, well, develop products, but also communicate them along the way. Yeah, you know, one of the beautiful things about uh, design, at least in my mind, is that um, individuals don't necessarily need to be part of of the entire design process. I mean, I, the way I think about it is that different um, different individuals with different uh, skills and abilities and knowledge and decision-making capability step in and out of the design process as we kind of walk through it. And so, um, you know, if, if your partnership um, is able to uh, create a diversity of, of working groups and technical teams and, and decision-making teams, so much the better, because then the coordinator or coordinators, um, the facilitator, whoever it might be who's kind of shepherding the process, could reach out to the appropriate uh, folks at appropriate times in the design process. Um, not everyone has to be fully engaged in this the whole time. And that's the good news, I think. Now, a challenge with that is ensuring that knowledge that is obtained from one set of players during the design process is able to transfer that knowledge to the next set of, of individuals. You know, so a technical team or a suite of, of multidisciplinary research teams that are going out and compiling data, and compiling information, synthesizing that, um, at some point is going to have to hand that off to, to a different set of players. And so, you know, having a meeting where there's that knowledge transfer is incredibly important. All throughout the design process, that's just one example, but all throughout the design process, um, transferring knowledge and ensuring that there is collective understanding um, is incredibly important. Or else you get at the end of the process and inevitably somebody doesn't know how we got to a point. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thanks, Rob. I think that's um, especially difficult when you're in the middle of a process to make sure that you're documenting things and that you have the patience to go back and um, bring new people um, up to speed as well. Um, sometimes that feels a little bit like you've been repeating yourself a lot, and instead it's really incredibly important, um, as well as I think helps develop some of the ownership for folks who have been involved in a process from the beginning. They become the experts outside of just staff. So I, I think that that is a key point to remember. Well, with that, um, we are right at the top of the hour. I want to, again, thank everybody for your time today. Um, as we mentioned, this will be made available on our YouTube channel in um, about a week or so. If you um, have any questions, um, please, again, make sure that you send me an email, and I'll follow up with you. If you'd like a copy of the presentation, I can do that as well. Thank you so much, Rob, for your time today. Um, this was the kickoff webinar for um, introducing landscape conservation design, um, our webinar series from the Desert LCC. We did recently also have another one um, from Rua Mordecai on how to select indicators, and we have several coming up over the next few months. So we'll keep everybody informed um, and hopefully up to date. And uh, again, thank you, Rob. Thank you, everybody. And I hope you have a great day. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, everyone.